Mercenary Mark Spector died in Egypt under a statue of the moon god Khonshu. In the shadow of the ancient deity, Mark returned to life and took on Khonshu's aspect to fight crime for his own redemption. He went completely insane and disappeared for a time, but returned to protect those who traveled by night. At least, that's what he thinks will happen. Mark stands before the tomb of Khonshu, gazing up at the face of the guardian statue. He is illuminated by a pale light of the full moon before he is beckoned by Khonshu. He is afraid, but one step at a time he enters, and with every step he feels pain. Mark tells Khonshu that he's afraid to die as he enters the final door. Khonshu, sitting before Mark, tells him that pain is necessary for death, and death is necessary for rebirth. Mark is nothing, and before he becomes something, he must remember who he is. At that moment, Mark does not know who he is. He looks down at the feet of Khonshu and sees a small golden chest waiting to be opened. Mark kneels down, opens the chest, and sees the hood of Moon Knight. This must be who he is. His time as a mercenary, Mark Spector. His time as Stephen Grant, wealthy philanthropist. And his time as Jake Lockley, the cabbie who roams the late night streets protecting the unprotected. He slips the hood on and remembers it all. As all the memories enter his mind, he lets out a scream in pain before he wakes up. Mark's dream causes him to stir out of his bed and onto the floor. As he comes to grips with reality, two orderlies, Billy and Bobby, storm into his room. They have warned him about yelling before. At this rate, he's going to wake up the other patients again. Mark pleads to the two men, telling them that he doesn't know where he is and that he doesn't belong there. He needs their help. Bobby laughs and punches Mark to quiet him down. Bobby punches Mark so hard that Mark spits out blood by accident on Bobby's white scrubs. They have warned Mark about making messes too, and Bobby kicks Mark in the ribs. Mark falls to the ground, doubled over in pain, and calls out for Conchu for help. The orderlies have had enough of this nonsense, and Billy puts Mark in a chokehold in order to hold him still while Bobby injects him with a syringe, causing Mark to slowly lose consciousness. Mark slowly wakes up, strapped to a table in a small room with the two men looking down at him with the mischievous smiles on both of their faces. Again, Mark pleads, whoever these men are, they need to understand that he isn't crazy and that he doesn't belong here. Before he can finish, Bobby tells Billy to stuff his mouth and turn on the machine. Billy turns on the machine used for electrotherapy to a dangerous degree, resulting in Mark screaming out in pain between gritted teeth. Mark's hands clench and blood, sweat, and tears fly up from his face as he convulses on the table. Billy chuckles to himself as he turns the power up even higher. Mark now has no more strength to stay awake and loses consciousness once again. Later. Mark sits in the community room, staring off into space, with bruised eyes filled with disdain. He looks on as he takes in his environment. The woman, directly to his left, seems to be finishing up a one-sided conversation. If she can just get the coffee ready and fire up the grill, then they're all set to open up shop. Mark, confused as to what the woman is speaking about, begins to stand up to leave. The woman asks him, what is he upset about? It can't be her food. He hasn't even tasted it yet. Instantly, he stops in his tracks and he turns back to look at the woman. He knows her. At least, he thinks he knows her. He can't remember her name, but he remembers that she owns a diner. He remembers visiting her at that diner. So why is she locked up in here? 
Mark's concentration is broken when the news report begins on the TV. Moon Knight was sighted last night in an altercation against one of his longtime foes, the sultry stained glass Scarlet. Mark stands there staring at the TV with his mouth agape when an old man with a colorful vest comes up from behind him and warns him not to pay attention to that rubbish. It's all part of the big lie anyway. Pure fabrication. Mark turns to the man with confusion painted on his face. The old man extends his hand and introduces himself. His name is Bertrand Crawley, and he has met Mark before, a couple of times. But he forgives Mark for not remembering him. The people in charge of this hospital have enough drugs pumping through Mark's body to put down a horse. He then goes on to state that Mark is the rightful fist of Khonshu, and only he can set them all free. Before they can speak any further, Billy and Bobby come back to collect Mark and drag him by arm out of the room. Time for his therapy session. On his way out, he sees a woman with a blank face sitting in a wheelchair, staring at a wall. Another memory rushes to the forefront of his mind. He thinks to himself that there's no way that this can be Marlene, his old girlfriend. That doesn't make sense. He calls out to her but is quickly pushed forward by the orderlies out of the room. In his therapy session, his doctor, Dr. Emmett, questions him. He sits in a chair on top of a scarlet rug, staring back at his doctor with the scarlet hair and a scarlet sweater. She clicks on her scarlet pen and adjusts her scarlet glasses as he begins his plea. He tells the doctor that he woke up this morning in a place that he doesn't remember he remembers pieces of different lives. Moon Knight, the vigilante, Jake Lockley, the cab driver, Stephen Grant, the millionaire. He just needs to know which one is really him. Dr. Emmett sighs and begins to ruffle through her desk. She tells Mark that none of the personas are real. They're all a grand elaboration created by his mind. There is indeed a Moon Knight, but it isn't him. She stands up and slides Mark an old notebook of his that she had confiscated. Mark looks down at the open notebook and sees numerous scribbles and doodles detailing various adventures of the Cape Crusader cloaked in white. Again, he can't believe his eyes. And he can't believe his ears when Dr. Emmett tells him that they have had the same conversation with each other 12 times. None of these stories ever happened. They were created by a child. That night, Mark laid in his bed wide awake. It did not take much time at all before he attempts to speak with Khonshu. He asks Khonshu if Dr. Emmett is telling the truth. Is everything just a lie? Khonshu responds that if Mark truly believed this, and he truly questioned Khonshu's existence, he wouldn't be attempting to speak with him now. Kanchu proclaims that now is not the time for second guesses or to wallow. He instructs Mark to rise and prepare to fight. Mark fashions a cape and cowl out of his bleached white bedsheets and lets out a war cry, summoning Billy and Bobby back to his room. This time, he is prepared. The orderlies open the door, and Mark can see them for who they truly are. The once human heads of the orderlies are now the heads of jackals. Mark knew it. They were all lying to him. Mark begins to savagely beat down the two orderlies, sending blood flying in different directions across the room. When the two are finally incapacitated, Mark makes for his escape. He bursts through the emergency exit and runs to the roof of the building. He can finally see the world for how it really is. As he opens the door to the roof, he sees the New York is covered in sand, pyramids, and the Egyptian angels of death. How long has Mark been captured and detained? As he stares up to the full moon for guidance, Kanchu tells him that a full-scale invasion has begun. Their enemy 
upset has used this opportunity to attack and take over this reality. However, before they can address that issue, the orderlies are back and they have brought reinforcements. Mark turns to escape and is instantly tackled by Bobby. Each of the orderlies take their turn to take out their anger on Mark before one speaks up in order to stop the others. Dr. Emmett would be displeased if they killed one of her patients. Bobby snatches the hood off Mark and Mark pleads for him to return it. Without the mask, Mark can't see their faces. Bobby tells Mark to cut it out and open his eyes. There's nothing to see. The city skyline returns to normal and Mark is speechless. As the orderlies carry Mark away, he calls out to Kanchu. He calls out for help and he asks why Kanchu won't respond to him. As he looks back into the moonlit skyline, he wonders to himself if it was real. Did any of it really happen? Or has he just been crazy all along?